seems such a long time ago. <laughs> and um, Deb, Deb Bailey, you got a birthday coming up on Wednesday. Congrat hmm? Tuesday, congratulations. Yeah. I was saying to Deb earlier on, I've, we've known one another for a long time because her, her dad was a priest in the diocese, Doug Madge, and um, uh, we had connections up in the Bruce County. And uh, I remember I was trying to figure out how old Deb was because um, she must have been about 11, 12 when, uh, when, my, when our oldest was born. So, and, I, and I won't tell you how old Matthew is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, congratulations, Deb. Any other, um, any other celebrations? Well, oh, good. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> No, 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 you don't need to. <laughs> well, you know, then you, congratulations, though. Well, then you get to a stage where um, um, you, you sort of, you're proud of your age when you turn 87, you know. That's, that's, you, don't, you don't mind sharing that with people. Okay. Well, may this, uh, as we gather together, may this be a time of refresh, spiritual refreshment for all of us, regardless of whatever we may be carrying, and I am very conscious that, um, that there's some heaviness that is being carried, especially we remember in our prayers this morning, Belinda uh, and her family in their, in their bereavement. And I know there are others who are seeking and, and are pleased to, to know that we are gathered together in prayer and uh, are keeping them in mind. So may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And with those for whom we pray. I invite us to stand. As we gather together in praise and in prayer, we prepare ourselves for the collect for purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open.
Apostolic today. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you, and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do, and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our first reading is from Genesis. These are the descendants of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, of Paddan Aram, sister of Laban, and the Aramean. Isaac prayed the Lord for his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together with her, and she said, if this is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. When her time to come uh, to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so that they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff for I'm famished. Therefore he was called Edom. Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. And Esau said, I am about to die of what use is a birthright to me. Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. The word of the Lord. Today we're just going to say the psalm, and if I could get you to repeat the uh, refrain after uh, I say the, uh, the verse, that would be great. Uh, Your word is a lantern to my feet and a light upon my path. I have sworn and I am determined to keep your righteous judgments. Your word is a light upon my path. I am deeply troubled. Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, O Lord, the willing tribute of my lips, and teach me your judgments. Your word is my God. My life is always in my hand. Yes, I do not forget your law. The wicked have set a trap for me, but I have not strayed from your commandments. Your life is a light on my path. Your decrees are my inheritance forever. Truly, they are the joy of my heart. I have applied my heart to fulfill your statutes forever and to the end. Your word is a light upon my path. Gradual hymn.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus went out of the house where they were and sat beside the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while, and when trouble or persecution arises on account of that word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. The Gospel of Christ. Please be seated. Let's get my act together here. So many things going on. Uh, you know, um, thank you, Steve, for reading the the first uh, reading. Um, that's the way it is in July and August. But I um, and it just so happened that that fortunately. I printed out the uh, the reading and, and gave it to him, not, not knowing it that's going to happen. But anyway, um, you know, I just mentioned these things because um, really appreciate not what happens during July and August, but what has been happening over the past. Uh, well, it's gone now almost nine months or 11, more than that, <laughs> and uh, no. So, words of appreciation for myself, but I know also the war I'm speaking on behalf of the wardens and, and all of us for people stepping up and uh, and uh, and filling 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 the, filling the need, and uh, indeed there have been many. So, in whatever way you have been able to do this and continue to do, uh, thank you so much. You know, I was. Um, 
going to, to uh, share some reflections on the gospel we just heard just now, but um, I'm going to reserve that for um, another, another Sunday, because I'm going to be here for another two Sundays. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's, an interesting, uh, it's an interesting gospel, that one, uh, the, the parable of this, of this. So, you know, Jesus said um, he never explained his parables, but Matthew seems to get into his head that he has to explain every one of them. But anyway, we'll, uh, we'll get talk about that later. You know, um, I want to, I, I'm glad Steve uh, stood up to read because um, I want to share a few reflections on the first reading. You know what's happening in, um, in the summer months during July, during the July and August anyway, every year, we follow a sequence of readings from the Old Testament. And this particular year, you know, the, it's divided up so that if you come to church every Sunday for three years, you're going to have the entire, um, entire Bible read or reflected upon, at least the main, the main sanguine parts. So what's happening now, we're following the book of Genesis. So we're following this dysfunctional family, uh, the family of Abraham. Uh, we'll get into that in a minute. Now, on the other, on next year, at the same time, we'll be following the um, book of Exodus and, uh, and also later on King David. And those stories come from the southern kingdom of Judea. There's a collection, there's a whole collection of these myths or legends or stories that were gathered together, but they came, you've got to remember that the that it was two kingdoms. There was Israel to the north, and there was Judah to the south, and they all had their own particular um, uh, histories and, and uh, their, their fables and stories. This one comes from the northern England, from nor northern, northern kingdom um, of Israel, following the story of Abraham. Now, last night... I was visiting some friends, and we got talking about, um, you know, what are you watching these days? And uh, I said, well, there's nothing, nothing, I can't find anything, I think, maybe run out, but there's nothing that I can find really worthwhile watching. And then came up about that um, series, well, have you watched Succession? I said, well, I watched it for the first, the first first part, and then I said, I got so tired of the um, uh, lack of vocabulary. <laughs> Just as she, I said, the script writes, I mean, I, mean I, I got tired of it after, and I said, that's enough, is enough, and, and besides, besides, I said, I couldn't find a nice person in the group anyway. <laughs> but this is something interesting, though, how fascinated we are with people's lives that get messed up like that and confused. And, you know, I mean, that's what sells Netflix, anyway. Anyway, what I'm getting on is, this is the whole point of what I want to share this morning. Um, dysfunctional families. <laughs> uh, sibling rivalry, particularly in this case, of Esau and, and Jacob. It's a competition that exists between brothers and sisters for attention, and I guess most families have to contend with it if they had two or more children. But it can have positive, re, re, despite what, I, what you see on succession or anything else, does, there are some positive things happen. You know, I'm thinking of Venus and Serena Williams, you know, who have tennis in their blood, but both of these prodigies have been ranked number one in the world in women's singles. And they both benefited from their sibling rivalry. And while Serena Williams has succeeded her older sister on numerous occasions, Venus Williams continues to be a world player in her own right. In the Christian Gospels, Jesus and his apostles 
repeatedly tell their followers to love one another as brothers. And this repeated admonition may tend to give a certain impression that brotherly or sisterly love is a natural condition that will come forth by itself whenever there are brothers or sisters within a family and that parents don't have to do anything but relax and watch the unfolding of this wonderful natural phenomenon. Well, think again. <laughs> Claudia and I have experienced, and our, I guess our marriage has survived <laughs> the competitive personalities of our own four children, especially uh, the younger twin daughters. From the time they were born, and Claudia uh, had no idea she was giving twin, birth to twins until about half an hour before the delivery, and then decided to go down to get an x-ray. They thought it was all gas. <laughs> but um, she knew that something, something odd was happening all along. <laughs> and, um, you know, from the time they, they sure struggled within their womb, from the time they were born, Fiona and Sarah struggled to assert their individual will while retaining their special bond as twin sisters. Each appears to confront her shadow and to confront this in her sister. And yet, in spite of combat, uh, they refuse to allow this to sever their unique bond of affection, respect, and love for one another. You know, before they could even walk, we had to, in, in those days, we, we used playpens. So I don't know whether they allowed them these days, but anyway. <laughs> we had to purchase two play pens to prevent them from killing one another. <laughs> uh, they'd be fighting over the possession of the plastic toys. Uh, and, you know, they still remain assertive, and they still refuse to be dominated by the other. It's never ceased. And, and ultimately, they chose the same careers. And uh, having accepted, and they sure needed it, professional counseling, and very supportive husbands. They now live happily within walking distance of one another's families, and they enjoy one of the most successful real estate businesses as a partnership in Toronto. So they've done very well. There are a number of theories when it comes to finding the root of sibling rivalry and the endless combinations of possible factors. And sadly, as we all know, these do not always produce positive results. And some childhood feelings manifest themselves in ugly resentment. I men mentioned that Netflix and succession, but you know, you don't have to go that far. Just read the book of Genesis. <laughs> read, read the book of Kings, you know. It's, uh, it's all there, it's all there, you know. It's, it's, it, there's, a, there's a Netflix series right there in the book of Genesis. Um, they're all attempting to explain the causes and the conse consequences of sibling rivalry. And within these stories, God is personified as a heavenly parent. You know, they include the stories of Cain and Abel, and uh, this morning's story of Jacob and Esau. Sibling rivalry is vividly portrayed in this story of the twin brothers, Esau and Jacob, who are engaged in a tussle for their father's blessing or right of inheritance or succession. Now, social and cultural mores anticipated that Isaac's blessing of family inheritance would be passed on to the firstborn son, Esau. Instead, it was passed on to the second, Jacob, who inherited the family inheritance. And he achieved this by first taking advantage of his brother's impulsive behavior, and secondly, by taking advantage of his father's blindness 
and senility. No wonder Esau was overwhelmed with resentment and anger. Jacob is not a very nice person. <laughs> you know, and Isaac, bless him for all his faults, no wonder he finished up the way he was when you think about uh, his relationship with his father Abraham. Yeah. Being frustrated, though, and even jealous with a sibling that's outshining you is something that a lot of people can relate to. And among those of us without siblings, there can also be the rivalry between cousins or peers as they compete for the attention of parents or teachers. And it can lead to violent behavior if it remains constant and unchecked. And Esau's held a grudge against Jacob and even planned to kill him. So when did this all begin? Well, the dynamics that spurred this rivalry between Jacob and Esau are the actions and the relationships of their mom and dad. I said Isaac was a weak character. He never knew how to assert himself. Rebecca and Isaac were united in marriage, but they were separate entities in spirit. It was an arranged marriage to begin with. Isaac couldn't even pick his own wife. They failed to communicate well with one another. And you and I know that how parents get along in front of their children communicate lessons in life about how best to treat others. And Jacob's behavior was a consequence of his parents' relationship because Rebecca was very underhanded, both with her children Esau and Isaac and with her husband. And she encouraged her youngest child, Jacob, to deceive his brother and to deceive her husband, Isaac. And it would seem that Jacob inherited poor marriageable skills from his parents, as is seen in the next example of sibling rivalry in the Old Testament, which is going to be discussed in two weeks' time. That's the story of the two sister and sisters, uh, Leah and Rachel, and their strange relationship. Yeah, I see, this is, this is all Netflix stuff. <laughs> Probably no situation on earth could bring out the worst sibling rivalry between sisters than for them to be married to the same man. And both Rachel and Leah were Jacob's wives, and they constantly battled for his attention and affection. But that's in a couple of weeks' time. Right now, we're looking at Jacob. He was not an attractive person. Jacob survived by guile and deceit. Instead of security and happiness, though, it resulted in him in living in the fear of his life. He was constantly fleeing from the wrath of all those he cheated to acquire his considerable wealth and property and in inheritance. Esau, on the other hand, I believe is worthy of our respect. Well, he has more than a chip on his shoulder, a ton of bricks. And he carried up, built up anger and resentment and hurt towards his brother, for over 25 years. And I guess, you know, you have to identify the guy. I mean, I can't understand it. He cheated the way he was. And when, though, Esau eventually catches up with Jacob, he realized, well, you know, all that's gone on, but, you know, I really want a brother. I want to be reconciled with my brother. So instead of slaying Jacob, Esau embraced him and wept with tears of joy and relief. He not only spared the life of his prodigal brother, Esau guaranteed Jacob's safety and future prosperity. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
When Jesus was asked, why do you speak in parables? He answered, because seeing, they're not seeing. And hearing, they're not hearing. Nor are they understanding. That's why Jesus told his stories that describe situations in everyday life to convey a spiritual meaning. Not only Jesus, but our natural world and human experience speaks to us in parables when we have time to pause, to look, and to listen. These stories in Genesis can be taken in much the same way. All of life, all of creation, expresses our connection with the mystery and the wonder of God. And to those to whom it is revealed, Jesus says, Blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. So the stories that we hear from Genesis are all at ancient stories, fables and legends, memories, all struggling to make sense of a human situation. In the case of the Jewish people, it was all to do with where they were coming from and why they were having the mess in their lives and what was going wrong and what was going right. But still true today, what is the cause of war, of violence? Why do so many people, millions, walk in hunger? And the sad truth of it is, and it's from these stories, and Jesus repeated them, it's the result of human greed, human fear, and rivalry. And so complicated are these patterns of human greed that individual will is insufficient to reverse them. They require our constant cooperative efforts and our recognition that human existence is a sacred trust. And it also requires of us to get down on our knees before God, despite all the crud that we cause in our existence, loves us to the end. Amen. Now, I think we, what do we sing now? We, we sing the, sing the, oh, it's, no, it, that's right, it's written, isn't it? Okay. I invite us to stand. And let us declare our faith in God. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven shadows here. With faith and the love of God in union with Christ and in the power of the Spirit, let us offer our prayer before the throne of grace. Let us pray for divine peace and justice throughout the world, especially at this time for Ukraine and for all people who may receive the good news of this, his victory. May peace abound and righteousness flourish. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray for this country, 
our province, our municipality and city, for all who serve in positions of leadership. May the Lord, may the Lord direct them in ways that uphold justice, honesty, and truth. Lord, graciously hear us. Let us pray for wisdom to care for the earth and till it, to act now for the good of future generations and all creatures, and to become instruments of a new creation. Founded upon the covenant of love, let us pray for the will to nurture and the resources of the earth to the glory of God, our Creator. Lord, graciously hear us. For the Holy Church of God throughout the world, for Todd, our bishop, for Megan, his territorial archdeacon, and for Neil, our priest, and for our parish community of faith that both corporately and severally we may have the means and opportunity to minister as Jesus gave us an example. May we faithfully walk in his way and humbly serve to extend his compassionate love. Lord, hear us. For the poor, the destitute and the homeless, for those vulnerable and alone, for those who have expressed a need for our prayerful support and for all who are anxious or challenged in health, body, mind and spirit for pat for max for angie betty rita of belinda and family on their bereavement and for stuart and paul may they be inwardly anointed by the holy spirit and receive comfort and healing Nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God. In the name of Jesus, we commend to God's gracious keeping all who have entered into the shadow of death. Rest eternal grant unto them, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon them. Lord, in mercy, hear our prayer. With the faithful departed in company of blessed saints and all the host of heaven, we commend ourselves to God's mercy and protection. Let our voices rise to praise God's glory. Alleluia, 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 amen. Dear friends in Christ, let us confess our sin toward God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sin. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
thanks and praise, for in the ocean of your steadfast love, you hear us and place the song of your spirit in our hearts. When we turn from your love and defile this earth, you do not abandon us. Your spirit speaks through the prophets, sages, and saints in every age to confront our sin and reveal the vision of your new creation. Joining in the song of the universe, we proclaim your glory singing. humanity. Through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, you open the path from brokenness to health, from fear to trust, from pride and conceit to reverence for you. Rejected by a world that could not hear or bear the gospel of life, Jesus knew death was near. His head anointed for burial by an unnamed woman. Jesus gathered together those who loved him. He took bread, gave you thanks, broke it, and gave it to his friends, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, gave you thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. And now, as we gather at this table in response to his commandment to share the bread and cup of Christ's undying love and to proclaim our faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Breathe your Holy Spirit, the wisdom of the universe upon these gifts that we bring to you, this bread, this cup, ourselves, our souls and bodies, that we may be signs of your love for all the world and ministers of your transforming purpose. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, creator of all, and we bless your holy name forever. Amen.
died with you on the cross. Now we are raised to new life. We were buried in your tomb. Now we share in your resurrection. Live in us that we may live in you.
I invite us to stand in prayer. Let us praise God. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we could ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the Church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and those for whom you pray, this day and for always. Amen. Please be seated. Once again, I would want to uh, repeat the announcement I made last week in preparation for Greg, but also for one another. It makes it so much easier if we're wearing name tags. So um, whether you be new to the parish or not, uh, whether you be an old time, <laughs> uh, please wear your name tag and, um, and also uh, order one, this is the last week actually, that Christine's gonna put in an order this week, but she'll do it again later on in the fall. But uh, just, uh, it makes it so much easier for, for Greg when he's uh, here getting to know you. You and I know him, <laughs> but uh, it, and I, I, found, I found through personal experience just by having you wear your um, uh, name when you come up and receive communion to be able to, to speak your name, personal name, 
And, I, and I've had feedback that people really appreciate that. So it works both ways. We're all blessed by it. So uh, please don't hesitate to, to put in an order if you haven't got one. Thank you. Have a good week.